Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jason Bates, and I guess the key message today is this one, which isn't something you hear very often. Um, I actually stole this or stole this idea um, from some work that I did at Facebook uh, a fair few years ago. I don't know if you know, but Facebook has uh, an internal propaganda division. No one's from Facebook here, I hope. Um, and while large banks and large organizations might do change management and, and run workshops and away days and all kinds of things, Facebook approaches culture change a little differently. They, uh, they grab a phrase, a meme, some kind of view, and they make posters and stickers, and they, they try and spread this idea. So one you might have heard is, is move fast and break things. And this isn't because that's what they really want. It's they're trying to edge culture that way. Their engineers are so perfectionist, they're so strong, that actually they take a very long time to, to launch things. And so by saying move fast and break things, it just moves the culture along. And I hope that that's what this does, because in the end, there are a lot of people in the audience and a lot of people that I go and talk to in large banks that will say, you know, banking's 99% finished. We've been in banking, you know, the world's been in banking for a very long time. There are a lot of products that everyone knows very well, whether that's current accounts or unsecured personal lending or mortgages or credit cards or anything like that. But I guess the message for me today, or the message I'm trying to bring across, is that it's not 98% finished. It's actually 1% finished because of this thing called digital. So how did I get into this world? I, I started on, on this side, doing the, the big consulting piece, the international transformation programs, breaking companies apart over six or seven countries in compressed timeframes. And, um, and during that work, found that my work with executives and board members, um, I found that people just didn't really get what digital was about. They didn't get how to change customers' lives. They were very much isolated from that by layers and layers of insight companies and research companies and their own staff. They didn't get how you did it, how you actually implemented uh, digital in a, in a new, new world. You know, they understood IT and how that had been done for a long time, but not digital. And they didn't get how it would change their business model, how it would actually change the industry. So I did some, I started a digital transformation consultancy, trained some people at Facebook, did some work for Google, and uh, ended up doing a lot of work for Barclays where we launched this amazing thing called the Digital Eagles program. But this is where things start to get really quite a little bit crazy because I was having a great life here and then suddenly started two new digital banks in the UK. Um, and so what happened? Well, one of my original clients from back here was a, a lady called Anne Bowden, who is the CEO of Starling Bank in the UK. And she, back there, was a CIO of uh, Aon, a very large insurance company. And in the, pre in the years in between, when I was doing all this stuff, she'd, uh, she was head of transaction banking at ABN AMRO. She'd been COO of Allied Irish Bank. She was a career banker. She understood what was going on. So I met her in a, uh, in a hotel lobby. We were having a chat, and she was saying, Jason, I've got this pitch for you. I'm going to start a bank. And imagine this, you know, you're living your life quite happily, and there hasn't really been a new bank in the UK for 150 years. And here's this, this uh, very established banker saying, we're going to start a new one. And her pitch was really this in three parts. One, regulatory change. In the UK, there's a, a very established but boring market of the big five banks taking 80-85% of the customers, and it has been that way for a very long time. I was joking this morning that the average length of time that someone holds a current account is something like 16 years, and the average length of marriage in the UK is 12 years. So you're probably with your bank longer than you are your, uh, your wife or your husband. So um, some would see this as a poorly performing market. Is that competitive when you just stay with one provider? And if everyone is doing that, where's the drive to innovate, to actually deliver better services? So the, the UK government introduced a current account switching program, which allowed the, the population in order to, to move bank accounts. And the effect of that, nothing. No one switched. Two or three percent of the population ended up moving because they were disgruntled customers or some bank was offering you 150 pounds to move across. So the second part of the, uh, the story, the most important part from my perspective, is that they opened up the, um, the ability to get a new banking license. And so there are something like 38 new banking licenses in process and probably four uh, new retail challenger banks that are going to launch this year. 
So great, the opportunities there. What's the next piece? Well, Anne had worked in the legacy banks, the, the big banks, and said there were some real problems there on a particular way of thinking about financial products that we'll get onto in a minute, and also legacy systems. Some of these banks have four or 5,000 operational, bank, uh, operational um, applications with tens of thousands of interfaces. And that makes innovation, that makes moving forward very, very difficult. And the third piece, the digital shift. Everyone now has a smartphone in their pocket, 78% of the UK do, and half of those people, according to some surveys, check it within five minutes of waking up. There's just been this, this shift, this fundamental change in how we access services. The big incumbents are, are struggling, and now there's the opportunity to, uh, to, to start a new bank. So that's all very well, and Anne sort of grabbed me. Imagine going home after that meeting and telling your wife that you're going to leave your successful business to go and start a new bank crazy. But still, the question remains, what, what comes in the center? Because that's market context. But what do you launch? How are you going to, to get a few million customers to actually come across to actually join your bank? In this market where some would argue it's sticky, you know, there's n there isn't a lot of switching. How, what happens there? And the problem there is that, well, haven't banks been digital for a long time? I mean, we can we can go back to 1990 and, and digital banking was there, and we've made amazing progress in the last you know, 20 or so years. I mean, look. So, uh, I mean, there's, well, the, the fonts are better, the design's better, but actually when you come down to it, the difference is the 200 billion that's been spent across the industry, because there are, systems, there are mainframes, there's legacy, there's a whole host of things that need to, to change, to update, even to start moving in the right direction. But, but this is part of a problem. This was why my wife looked at me and said, are you, are you crazy? Like, we've got a family and a mortgage and you're looking to start a new bank. And, uh, and bizarrely, I'd, I'd then, you know, later go out to a, um, to a, a dinner party and I'd be feeling very smug that I'm a co-founder of a new bank. I remember one particular conversation sitting next to a lady and explaining this to her, digital bank. And uh, she looked at me, and I knew that she was going to break some bad news to me. And she looked across and she said, my bank already has an app. And again, we're back at that thing, like, hasn't digital banking been done? Aren't we there yet? And, and I guess back to that 1% piece. No, we're not. You know, we're not there at all. Because digitized products are not the same as digital services. Putting a newspaper on an iPad is not digital news. Putting an out, selling an album on iTunes is not digital music. And putting a statement that used to be a passbook onto a, a mobile phone, that's not digital banking, that's digitized banking. We're taking what came before, the analog, and we're digitizing it. So I was, um, I was saying this morning, there's a, a guy way back in the 1960s called Marshall McLuhan, and he had this, uh, he was the guy who said the medium is the message. But he also had a, uh, another phrase, that, uh, that, uh, another quote, and that quote was that the, the new paradigms, the new media, start off as degradations of the, of the thing that came before. So in the end, like digitized banking, in some ways, isn't as good as, as branch-based banking. You know, you've got a little bit of information, but you you lack that human context, and you, you, know, you lose a few things. But we, we just haven't seen digital banking yet. And I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit about what that might be. But you can imagine actually b uh, going and talking to, uh, to large banks, um, and you say to them, OK, we're starting a new bank. Oh, what's your bank about? Well, it does this and that and the other. And the, the instant sort of retort is, ah, so you're launching a current account with some overdraft lending. Well, that's a bit boring. And it's that, um, it's that product-based lens which actually prevents people from seeing the opportunities that digital really de delivers. If you see the world in a, we make product, we distribute it, and that's banking, then uh, talking about intelligent digital services and how they can deliver value to customers' lives, trying to find that move from having a, uh, a picture of a newspaper on an iPad to something more is very difficult. So, you know, what is Monzo about on, 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 or Starling? I, in one hand, it is a current account. It's a, it's a current account with some overdraft lending. But actually, the way we defined it was very much more financial services for everyday money. And, uh, and that, 
um, that approach, that turning a bank into a services company, actually getting back to where we were before. You know, you go way back to when banking started. It really was interacting with customers and delivering valuable services rather than pushing commodity products. So Monzo started from that position. Um, and we were talking over lunch about this two-prong approach that we essentially took. On one hand, a banking license can take two years in the UK to, to create, get. So you go through a, a whole host of documentation and proving and challenge sessions with the, uh, with the PRA and the FCA on, on, on proving that you're going to have a viable business and a viable business model. But for any startup, for any, for any new organization, um, that's, that's an eternity. Are we really not going to talk to customers for, for two years? Well, if we were launching a current account, that's how long it takes to, to, until you can do that. But if we're doing financial services for everyday money, then we can look at other ways of serving. And so essentially, we launched this little pink card, a hot coral card, as a prepaid card. And we opened a, uh, an alpha, a beta test. At the start, this was just 15 cards within in the bank. And we, we had this crazy idea that with all of the customer interviews that we'd done, the thing that people were missing that, that, that we missed was this direct connection to their finances. That on the glide path from payday to payday, people were getting lost somewhere along there because their interaction with the bank wasn't in real time and, and involved these cryptic 18 character identifiers as to what that payment was. So we created a prepaid card, a minimum viable product, something really simple, and it did a couple of jobs phenomenally well. When you use the card in a shop, you get a push notification to your phone, and your balance updates. So we use the authorization message rather than the settlement, which again, to traditional bankers, that's, whoa, but that's not, that's not legally how much money is in the account. No, but it is how customers think about it. And on the other hand, the, the little messages you see up here, we added logos, we added, we, we cleaned the data up, we enriched the transactions with, with real data. And that was basically it. To start off with, that was it. Um, and this thing took off uh, from giving the cards out in our office and in engaging people in starting a new bank and helping us to build it. This, this um, increased to something like 150,000 customers just with this at the moment, who are in the alpha beta program, who are contributing towards building a bank. And meanwhile, at the same time, we were going through the banking license process. So, so we built an audience, we built, a, we built a, a proposition that worked, that provided value for customers, that loaded money onto this and then used it day to day as a way of, of growing customer base, as a way of learning about customers' problems, as a way of developing something, while at the same time knowing that we were going to turn into a bank. So Monzo's been pretty successful with, what are we famous for? Um, we, uh, together with this transparency and openness, we decided we'd let these, uh, the, the initial customer base invest in the bank. So in one of the funding rounds, we did equity crowdfunding with Crowdcube, and we broke the platform. We uh, received a million, pound, a million pounds of investment in 96 seconds, uh, which is the fastest equity crowdfunding round in the world. Uh, and even in that, we limited people to a thousand pounds maximum of investment. So it wasn't just one or two people. Th this was, I think, about 1,800 people who invested. Um, we got 150,000 testers. We've been covered by the financial press. We're very much out there doing things. And we've recently ran another uh, crowdfunding raise. This time we learned our lesson and we said, well, why don't you register your interest? And there's two and a half million in order to, uh, of, of allocation. And then we'll, we'll run a poll. And we received 12 and a half million pounds worth of applications from end customers, from consumers. So what have I learned? I, I was thinking, you know, coming today, it's like, how do I squeeze three years of building challenger banks and w going around now working with big b banking brands on becoming truly digital? What are the, the key lessons I'd leave you with? If there's just three things, what would they be? And those three things are about using truly digital capabilities to deliver valuable services to customers who are underserved and overcharged. And of course, there's always the for a lower cost than traditional service. But what does that mean? I mean, okay, truisms sounds great. Aren't we doing that already? So let me go into those. So what do I mean by truly digital capabilities? Well, imagine that you're, you're, it's day one, you've had that meeting with Anne Bowden, and suddenly she says, Jason, chief customer officer, head of product, head of proposition, right, we're building our own core banking system, we've got world-class engineers, we can basically do anything, what do you want to do? 
Where do you start from that? In the 98% done category, you might say, well, let's start with, uh, with what we have now and what we can improve. Like, let's look at the market, let's look what people are doing, and then develop from there. But actually, we started from the other end and said, what is it about digital that's different from before? What are the virtues of that, that paradigm, going back to the, the newspaper on the iPad, that make it different? What's truly digital banking from the point of view of, well, what, does tr what are truly digital services? So I've got a mnemonic for you, digital riches. And for me, this is where we start. So it's real time. Ne you know, previously, you know, a check clearance was based on the three days it took in the UK, was based on the three days it took you to ride a horse from the north of Scotland down to the south in order to take that check physically to your, your bank. That's obviously not the case anymore. So how does designing for real time, just as the prepaid card, really affect you? Intelligent. You know, uh, uh, one of the most arguably intelligent thing your current account might be able to do is a standing order. On this day, move this money to this account. You know, we're, we're way beyond that. We can have event-driven uh, transactional banking, where uh, if a, a, a utility bill comes in and it's 30% higher than you were paying last quarter, we can tell you about it. Hell, we could even connect you with, with some utility providers to help you change. There's, there's deep intelligence in every transaction that if you had a private personal banker looking after you, they'd be able to look at and do something with. There's context. These smartphones in your pockets, they have sensors, they have GPS. We know the date, we know time, we know location. We know who the person is who you're sending money to or is sending money to you. We know that every Friday when you go out, you probably settle the bar bill somewhere. Can we make that any more easy? And that combination of real-time, intelligent, contextual services then starts to open a, a whole suite of how can we do things for you? What are these services where we can look after your finances? Human is a super interesting one, because surely, like digital bank, how does human fit into this? But actually, it's one of the most important things, because not only fitting with how customers think about their finances, fitting in with the brutal realities of their life, what really are they trying to achieve? What are their day-to-day -day realities like, and how do we fit in there? But also wrapping digital in this human interaction, in the way you communicate with customers, in the way you support them, that, that is, a, is such a core component of digital. It's extendable. We just heard about PSD2. We just heard about open banking. And actually, Monzo is aiming just to deliver the, uh, the core everyday money services. And then it will, it, it's a marketplace. It will connect you with all of the other places your money goes. A pension, fine. Your mortgage, fine. Peer-to-peer -peer lending, fine. Actually, it's, it's just the place where your your day-to-day -day finances live. And then there'll be a connection to this broader disaggre disaggregated market. And social, how do you compare with other people? How do you, like, are you doing well? Do you pay more than your neighbors for particular services? How does this work? We live in families, we live in groups, in communities. Banking's very isolated. So, so from this perspective, we say we're not starting from a, a current account or a, you know, a, um, a, a loan or an, a, a mortgage. We're actually starting from a, a group of amazing, intelligent, real-time services that can, we can use in order to, to make customers' lives better. So uh, that all sounds great. It's like uh, motherhood and apple pie. Everyone loves that. But what does that mean? So it really comes down to what are valuable services for customers? If I talk to the 98% guys, they'll talk about the, the characteristics of a, of a current account. Like, what does that really mean? Sure, it's a balance and a card and a statement of a whole host of things. And actually, maybe we just take those and improve them all. I can give you a nicer looking statement. I can make it easier to pay. I can give you a portal to receive cash. But we've just talked about you know, real-time intelligent supercomputers in your pocket with ubiquitous networks. Is that, is that as far as we go? So, Actually, uh, in, in Silicon Valley and with digital, there's a, a, there's a big move towards working out what are those end jobs that people are using these things to do? If I said to you, when was the last time you looked at your statement, you might be able to tell me. Why did you look at your statement? Was it that you were just checking to see if there was some uh, transaction you didn't know about? Was it that you were looking to prove your ID to someone uh, elsewhere to be able to take a statement to them? Were you trying to find a particular transaction because you'd bought a particular product and wanted to prove it? 
those are all jobs to be done, and those can all be done better than giving you a, a dumb statement and saying, look after yourself. So in the, in the investigations, in the, in, the inter in the hundreds of interviews that we did, we ended up getting to the jobs to be done side. We ended up looking at the, the service gap. You might be given these things by your bank, but you're really trying to do these things. And with real-time intelligent contextual services, we can do those things. We can actually do those. So by, uh, it's not a coincidence that you know, the CEO of Target is going to visit customers' house houses to work out where they put their shopping, what they do. By understanding those brutal realities of customers' lives, we can bridge this gap and move from commodity financial products into intelligent digital services that deliver real value. And the good news is that that's valuable. That's really valuable to customers, and it makes money. It's no longer a commodity market where I'm saying, well, I offer 50 basis points more than you do, so I'm going to get all the customers. It's actually about making people's lives better, easier. And, and indeed, with, a, with some of these things, there's a savings app that has uh, led to 20% more savings for individuals after they were using it compared to before they were using it. There's some research by UCLA in the States that have shown that people who have real-time uh, updates on their finance spend 17% less a month you know, it can have a real financial impact. It can bring ease, simplicity, and clarity to customers. So to summarize this up, like what we're building in the future or, or where fintech is going is this guy. It's like Swiss banker for the mass market. And whether that's in the retail space where he's looking after your personal finances or whether it's in the transaction banking space where the services that Coca-Cola gets now will be delivered to SMEs. That's coming, there's a collapsing in the market. Not, with, not because we're going to deploy 50 bankers to help an SME, but because we're going to build services that do that. And actually, by we, to do that, we really need to understand what those customers' lives are like and how that works. So what we're seeing at the moment is, at least in the UK, a number of uh, businesses, a number of companies finding beachheads. You know, Facebook started at Harvard. Uh, eBay started with Beanie Babies. Everyone finds their beachhead into, into something. So Revolut offer a, a card that offers great forex rates for people traveling around the world. Loot is a, uh, a, a, a neobank that's aimed just at students because they have some very specific jobs to be done, some very specific needs. Maniz is a way of, of um, a kind of paid for current account that's for immigrants because in the UK they find it really difficult to open a bank account. There are lots of different ways into the market. But they're just beachheads. They're ways of getting in, starting, a, starting with something valuable that needs to be done that's underserved or overcharged and then expanding out, which we're already seeing with Revolut. So I hope that's, that backs up some of this digital banking's 1% done. Digitized banking, we're, we're going pretty well. That's been happening for quite a while. But actually, the new players that are coming along aren't aiming at that. It's not just a slightly better interface uh, with a lower cost organization to, uh, to run it. It's actually looking beyond that into the virtues of digital and what that really means. You may stream TV through Netflix. You may listen to it through Spotify. There are lots of people who are still buying CDs and vinyl. So there's this smear. There's some, very, there's some different ways in which populations and countries do this thing. But this is coming. So I guess to... to, to, to uh, to bring it to a, a point. Now I've argued uh, uh, for intelligent digital services along the bottom of my diagram. I would draw you what the banking battlefield looks like in the UK, just so you get a feel for how the players are, what they're doing, and how it works. Um, at the side, we've got number of customers. And obviously, at the top, we've got the, the big five, the, the big banks in the UK and where they are. Um, they're still you know, running these thousands of systems. They're supporting you know, all of the transactions, the entire finance of the country. But they're up at the top. Below the, those guys, you've got um, the brand challenges. You've got Tesco Bank and Virgin Money and a variety of smaller banks. Uh, they've been around for a while. Um, but they are very much sort of mini-me versions. They're pretty much staffed by similar people um, and uh, using similar systems. But they think, you know, the time is, is ripe. And actually, a lot of tier two, tier three banks in, across Europe that we've been talking to, or even lenders or retailers or utility companies, are saying, if you don't need branches on, a, on the high street, then uh, and that was the entry into getting into the tier one, 
then actually we could be a tier one player. We'll be a tier one digital player. So these guys are getting a bit feisty. Along the bottom, you've got the startup, the digital challenges, less than, than zero customers, you know, just starting, just getting to the, the line. And uh, uh, I, I would split these into two groups. On one hand, you've got the, um, the, the players that are using traditional, sort of core banking, traditional infrastructure. So you've got Atom, you've got Tandem in the UK, a few other players. And the, the theory here is that you'll be able to essentially zoom up this line. You can offer a lot of products fairly quickly because the systems are there. They are, it is systems that, op that run and manage finan traditional financial products. So you have to layer some things on top in order to, to get to this digital services place. But it gets you there fast. You know, you've already got FIS, Fiserv, Temenos, variety of vendors who are there in order to provide this, these things. And then you've got the guys on the other side, Starling, Monzo, a few others, who are looking at actually creating uh, banking systems that are, that are for digital services, that are for banking services, that are real-time, that are event-driven, that can consume and use vast amounts of data, that be, can be changed very rapidly, that are based on microservices, that do a whole host of clever things. And then you've got uh, the ever-present, ominous, uh, sort of floating, big, um, non-FS digital giants. Is Facebook going to get into banking? Is Amazon? Is Google? Google says they want to, uh, to organize the world's information. Banking information is pretty, pretty good and needs organizing. And they're up in the top corner. And then, so the question is, and a question for many of our clients um, uh, in the top corner is, so what do we do? I mean, we've got millions of customers. They're in prime position. But how do they get across that, uh, that, that, that world? And um, there are some problems. You know, there are digital transformation programs that have been running for, for many of the biggest banks in the world for quite a long time. And there's a barrier around legacy culture, around the, not only the systems, but the, the way companies are organized, the way they're incentivized, the way decisions are made, the way risk is managed, the way products are priced, that all essentially um, are self, um, uh, is a system that supports itself. Try and change one bit, great, we're going to launch this new thing, and you, you fight against the rest of the organization. And there's also the, the legacy IT. Can you really do something that it might cost £100,000 for a challenger bank to do? Well, it's gonna, it, you can, but it's going to cost you £4 million, and you need to wait for a bank holiday where we can change 25 systems and move things uh, along. So essentially, what, uh, if you asked me nine months ago what was happening, we're seeing lots of digital transformation programs. Let me, let, let's change the organization, let's develop it. I think we're seeing something a little different now. We're seeing a, a two-pronged approach. On one hand, the, the big banks are having to get bang for their buck. They're having to digitize. They're actually having to save costs to drive that bottom line to have better monthly, quarterly results um, uh, you know, as they develop. So there's workplace automation, there's all kinds of systems coming in, adding a bit to the complexity, but ultimately driving, driving out costs and doing better targeting. But at the same time, we're seeing now a number of players starting at the bottom. So they're actually moving a little bit across, but then launching new pieces down here. And I've been really pleasantly surprised with a number of, of very large banks that are now looking at starting new, thing, new things on the side. They're, they're not going to take on the Gordian knot of complete uh, organizational transformation in one go, but actually are looking at how can we develop something new either in the bank, slightly ap apart from the bank, or separately from the bank. And this is only the start. So with all of that stuff going on, we've still got open banking APIs and payments and lending integration and machine learning and marketplace banking and blah, 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 blah. So it's not that this is one wave that we're going to have to deal with. The, 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 the speed of change and the, the size of changes that are coming both in, uh, in the way that people in, uh, interact with services, in the number of players, in the number of new technologies, makes this a crazy, bizarre, interesting time. And the, the answer, at least from a challenger bank perspective, is that it isn't about new ideas and long-term strategic plans. It's about out-executing the competition. And almost every, you know, there's, there's a saying in Monzo of, you know, there is no secret source. There's nothing that's being developed that you guys haven't thought of previously. But actually, it's about how quickly and um, what's the cadence of being able to get out, to test, to develop, to expand, to grow. And I guess that's what I'll leave you with. You can find me at um, 
11FS. Uh, so we do, obviously, the consulting side. We run a podcast that's doing very well. We do investments and research and all kinds of stuff. But you can best find me on Twitter or come and find me in the break afterwards. Thank you very much.